there's so many things that come up that you don't think are going to happen. You're like, oh, I met someone or, oh, I'm going to be, you know, I'm going to start a family. It's it's hard to think that way, I think, in your early 20s oh, sure. when you're making tons of money. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then you have like that narrative too, where people are like, you're never going to find love. You're never going to have a family. So then I think they like kind of dive in a little bit deeper because of that too, because of that uncertainty. Um, I don't know. I was fortunate. Like when I got in, I was kind of like always dating the same guy and then we got engaged and then we got married and then we had a baby. So like our relationship has gone through like the entire trajectory, like since I've been shooting. So I've been really lucky. Um, okay. I don't know what it's like dating while you're shooting, especially if you're really famous. Like that has to be really hard. Um, you met like the father of your daughter was in the industry, right? Well, it's a funny story. So we're both fleshlight girls Mm -hmm. and he was actually the molder for fleshlight. So I met him. So he was, he's actually, yeah, he's my daughter's father. His name is Tony. So he works actually in the special effects industry. So he worked on Superman, um, Batman, he's worked on tons of Marvel movies. He's a costumer, he's a union costumer. And um, Fleshlight, when they were first starting their company, I was one of the first girls. And so I believe that the owner, Steve, I believe Mm -hmm. his son was doing the molds, I think periodically. And then they were like, okay, we need to step it up and get like a good molder. So they called around, you know, to some special effects houses in LA. And I remember Tony telling me this funny story that one of the prop guys was like, okay, who wants to go mold porn star vaginas (laughs) this weekend? And they were like, and no one said anything, right? Uh And then Tony was like, does it pay? (laughs) And he's like, yeah, they pay your flight, they pay your hotel. And you know, Fleshlight, they are amazing. They take such good care of us. Yeah, I love them so much. They're such a great company, right? So they flew, they flew us all out and uh, we met, he molded my, yeah, he, so I redid all of my textures. So he molded my mouth, my vagina and my butt. And we, we flew home. Actually, the photographer who shot everything was Holly Randall. Mm -hmm. So the three of us flew back to Los Angeles and yeah, we had a baby a year later. (laughs) (laughs) So it was kind of a whirlwind romance. We're still really good friends. We were together the first two or three years and then i uh, moved to italy with our daughter and we're still very close she spends she she's so lucky my daughter she gets to grow up in italy and she gets to grow up in the u.s oh my gosh with both of us yeah amazing yeah so you know like you said it's it's um i my husband now is a defense attorney he's a criminal defense attorney so i met my husband here in italy but it's it's very true that narrative and i I think that it's it's definitely who you surround yourself with. You have to have a life outside of the business. Mm-hmm. You have to. I tell girls when they're stuck and they say, I don't know what to do. I'm not sure what I might transition to. I tell them, what are your hobbies? What do you like? What are you into? You'll meet people there too. I think it's so important to just completely separate yourself once once in a while and Put yourself out there. Don't be afraid to put yourself out there. No, that's amazing advice. I wanted to ask you, like, so I couldn't agree more. It's really important to like make sure you don't spend too much time in your alter ego, right? So like there's Candace, which is like me, and there's Eva, which is, you know, the person that's comfortable getting naked in a room full of people and having sex in front of a bunch of people. Like those are I have to get into very different headspace to do one or the other, right? Absolutely. And when you first start, especially if you're like really popular out of the gate, it's very easy to want to stay in your alter ego because that's where the glamour is and the attention and the love and the money and all of these things that are just telling you like this is where all the fun is at. And it's easy to neglect the real you. How when you are like obviously one of like the most mainstream porn stars of all time, like how are you so like grounded and like you talk about spirituality you have a family like how did you not let your ego kind of like overtake because I've seen girls that have shot 10 scenes that are walking around and they're like I'm the queen of England right and right. Then, then there's you who's actually like this powerhouse right and you're just like you're very humble so how did you check your ego and have this healthy relationship with it one of the first things that happened to me uh, was in 2008 when we had that huge uh, crisis, financial crisis. Mm-hmm. 
I lost both my houses that day and a huge chunk of my savings. Wow. That was super, super humbling to me. And it was kind of in that moment. And by the way, I had worked since 2000, you know, putting money away, buying real estate. Like I was like, I'm on a roll. As you said, I was doing conventions, cash is flowing in. And to lose a lot of that was really, really humbling for me. It's humbling also because you realize that um, it's not everything. You know, it kind of it kind of forces you to say, well, um, I have to start over. You know, I'm just like everybody else. Mm -hmm. And I did. Uh, I, I mean, yeah, it was it was definitely, I think, losing a lot of what I had worked for mm -hmm. kind of made me realize I need to stop. I need to really take I, I need to have a backup plan. If this happens, I think just it's life. Life mm -hmm. just really hits you. And something that we're going through now with this pandemic, I think kind of also forces us to really reevaluate our priorities, mm -hmm. what's most important for us. When that happened in 2008, I was pretty I was pretty close to done as far as shooting goes. I think I had probably maybe half a year, one more year that I shot a few more scenes and I stuck them in the can and then I started releasing them. But I really reevaluated where I was going to go from there. So I went back to school and moving abroad was such a big it was a big relief for me because I found myself also kind of on this treadmill of when I was living in LA mm -hmm. of really forcing myself to just work harder, work smarter, always hustling. And I really wasn't taking any time for anything else. I thought if I stay here, I'm not going to focus on my goals. As you said, it's so easy to just do one more shoot. It's so easy to just go, oh, okay, I'll take this job. You know, we're constantly, we get this carrot dangled yep. all the time, right? No, just one more shoot. Mm -hmm. You don't even have to get naked. You're like, oh, all right, I'll chew up my Saturday doing that. When it's like, no, I was going to go meditate. I was going to hike. I was going to do something for me. Mm -hmm. But it's always that money, money, money mm -hmm. that sucks you back in. Yeah. And I think, so I've always lived on the East Coast and I just would travel to LA for like a couple weeks, like at most, like maybe oh, a smart. month. <laughs> It helped a ton because, again, going back to what you surround yourself with, I would come back the home. Lifestyle. Mm -hmm. I'd come back home to North Carolina and my husband would be like, um, can you tell Eva to like stay in L.A.? Like you're back home. Like, yeah. And I'd be like – at first I'd get really defensive and then I'm like, he's right. Like I'm being like a monster. And part of it was like I was surrounded by like cars and – like all of these dinners and you start to have like a false sense of who you are. And then also I, again, just like kind of bad experience after bad experience. I had to like kind of create this like porcupine shell of a person yeah. just to survive in some cases. Um, but yeah, I think something you learn. Oh, go ahead. no, you go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> no, I was going to say when you said porcupine shell, I've had, I've had similar experiences with, other girls in the industry. And one of here's one of the things that I always tell women right out the gate. You may never know why someone just doesn't like you. Mm -hmm. It could be because their boyfriend wanted to work with you. It could be because their agent said he wanted to sign you. It could be something completely made up. Mm -hmm. It could be a fan who crawls into your DM and said, well, you know, this girl said this. I mean, there's just such a huge matrix out there with all these things that are constantly you know what i mm -hmm. mean and it's a that that's the funny thing about entertainment is it's all interconnected in some way or the other um something that was always funny to me was i would always have fans say why don't you do mainstream why don't you do more mainstream movies why don't you do more of this and i tell them because the first few years that i was in the industry i was doing so well for myself and I was really arrogant. It never computed to me when a casting agent or someone would say, but she has to audition. I was like, well, I'm terrified. Why do I have to audition? <laughs> like I, I produce my own movies. Why are you asking me to audition? Mm -hmm. And they were like, because that's, that's what we do in mainstream. Like you're one of 10 billion in adults. You're the top of the top. So you can do whatever you want. And I was like, huh? Okay. So I decided to chance it. And I did this audition for the Sopranos. And I had to read with James Gandolfini. Well, let me tell you, 
I was pouring sweat, like pouring sweat because I'm not a mainstream actress. Uh It's just, you know, that's when I realized, holy crap, like you do have to, even people who suck, they have to be pretty decent because this is so not easy. But, you know, the moral of the story is I remember him saying, you know, it was nice reading with you. And I was just sweating and mortified. (laughs) And, you know, when you have these experiences, all these experiences, they, yeah, they humble you. And so I told myself, okay, you know, I'm just going to be a little bit nicer. I mean, it's, you know, I try not to read too much into what I think girls think or what they tweet or what they say. We do have a lot of experiences but I try to tell myself you know let it make you better Mm -hmm. some things you really just have to shrug off I I know now because we do so much with technology it's so hard to you know how many times have we read a text looked at it and we're we answered it in our head and then we went to make dinner and then days went by Mm -hmm. so I try not to think I did something she hates me because I know how careless I can be Oh, I'm the worst at re- like re- responding via text. Like, it- but I mean, we mean well. Shit, I thought I responded. Uh, and you mean well because you-, you answered it in your head, and you're like, you you're sending her good vibes. You're like, yeah, girl, I remember that day, but you never replied to her. But in your head, you did, and you were like, oh. Mm. So I think that yeah, we really just have to, um, I think take a take a beat, mm-hmm. and be nicer to ourselves and. I was so happy when you reached out to me too, because again, I think that when you, when I started in 2000 and then you had come in years later, we really never got to cross paths. Mm-mm. And there's so many women that I really did want to just like we're having, just wanted to have a nice conversation with, you know, because there's, I believe that there's so much more we have in common than we don't have in common. Oh yeah. Across the board. But we never get to convey that. No. And that I think, it, again, it goes back to like everyone giving you that really shitty advice of like not getting into anything real or deep. So then you never get to know anybody because like everyone's constantly walking on eggshells and living in this this fake character. And that's like, I guess maybe one of the reasons why I never got really close with anyone while I was shooting too, like that was in the industry is I would start forming these re- relationships like with, you know, girlfriends, guy friends, whatever. And then, like, they never really let you in. Like, it was, I can only know you so much. And then anytime, like, something real would happen or, I don't know, like, you have, like, those tests of relationships, right? To, like, see, like, what actually has staying power and what doesn't. And it just, they all kind of, like, just fell through. 